Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Seth Dowland, who is an associate professor of American religious history and chair of the Women's and Gender Studies program at Pacific Lutheran University, where he also teaches in the religion department, the history of Christianity and Islam in the United States, as well as seminars on the intersections of politics, gender, race, and American Christianity. His first book, Family Values and the Rise of the Christian Right, from 2015, examines the rise of family values politics among conservative evangelicals in the US from the 1970s to the 1990s. He has also written articles on elec uh, elections, politics, and the Christian um, and Christianity in America. And I would urge you to go look at them. They're outstanding and really helpful for understanding our current climate in the United States. He is currently working on a book under contract with Oxford University Press that examines the history of white Christian masculinity in America. He has published many articles and book chapters on the history of evangelicalism, focused in particular on the intersection of religion, politics, gender, and sexuality. Dr. Dowland is a generous colleague, an excellent teacher, and a nationally recognized scholar, and we are lucky to have him in our department. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dowland. I feel like we've all been blushing a lot this afternoon, and I'm blushing after that introduction. That was way too much. But um, uh, thanks to uh, all of you for being here this afternoon. Uh, the promotional materials that some of you may have looked at on the website um, promised a lineup of leading theologians. And I must confess, I don't consider myself a theologian, much less a leading one. Uh, I'm a religious historian. I hope you'll indulge me uh, at this late afternoon hour. Um, and I've realized sitting in the first two sessions today um, amidst all this um, kind of fascinating, uh, constructive theology, uh, vulnerable and um, well, well thought out uh, panel that we just heard about uh, sexuality, um, that as a historian, I'm maybe here to throw a little cold water on the proceedings. Um, <laughs> and uh, talk about some maybe not as uh, edifying stories, um, but uh, hopefully instructive nonetheless um, about where we've been, how we've got here, um, and the work we still have to do. Um, so uh, like any historian worth his salt, I will uh, promise a few good stories and, and hopefully some thoughtful reflections on our religious past. In 1921, Margaret Sanger had emerged as America's leading advocate for contraception. Spurred by her work as a nurse and midwife among poor New Yorkers, many of whom could not financially support all their children, Sanger saw access to birth control as a fundamental right. But she ran up against the law, specifically the 1873 suppression of trade in and circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use, commonly known as the Comstock Law. Its nickname came from Anthony Comstock, a vigorous anti-vice crusader who became US Postmaster General in order to censor the mail. The law under Comstock's guidance classified contraceptive literature and devices as obscene. When Comstock banned Sanger's sex, ex sex education column, What Every Girl Should Know, in 1913, her editor ran an empty box in the next issue under the headline, What Every Girl Should Know, Nothing, by order of the US Post Office Department. <laughs> <laughs> Comstock died two years later, but his cause of censorship lived on. Many Christians worried that contraception would undermine the family and went against God's plan for sexuality. Catholics in particular became some of Sanger's fiercest opponents as the Catholic Church in the 1920s consolidated its anti-birth control stance. The conflict between Catholic leaders and Sanger came to a climax on November 13, 1921, when she arrived at the New York Town Hall to give an address titled, Birth Control, Is It Moral? The doors to the auditorium were locked. After several minutes, 
Crowds on the inside unlocked them so they could get out, and Sanger's fans rushed her up to the podium. In an interview many years later, she recalled trying to begin her speech 10 different times, but the crowd noise and general confusion was too much. And then, New York Police Captain Thomas Donahue grabbed her, took her off stage, and threw her in jail. Sanger's supporters sang, My Country Tis of Thee, as she was led away. Two days after the town hall raid, the New York Times ran a story alleging that Archbishop Patrick J. Hayes sent his personal secretary to the meeting in order to encourage the police to shut it down. The secretary, Monsignor Joseph Deneen, claimed that children were in the hall. That was probably not the case. And thus, it was morally justified to ensure the meeting didn't proceed. Sanger could hardly have orchestrated better publicity for her cause. <laughs> she was released from jail and gave her address in a much bigger venue to 8,000 people just a week later. Now, I take this story from a wonderful new book called Moral Combat by the historian uh, Marie Griffith, who writes about the battles we've had over the past century or so uh, between uh, progressives and traditionalists over this issue of sex. And uh, Griffith's history details the kind of interesting aftermath of the town hall raid. Over the next decade, a number of Protestant ministers announced their support for contraception. Some of them did so because they didn't like Catholics. Some of them joined Sanger in voicing concerns about overpopulation that aligned with the popular new science of eugenics, or the study of heritable traits. And others framed their defense of contraception as an affirmation of the sacred worth of every individual. If society could not adequately support children born into poverty, we should offer ways for women to limit their pregnancies. By 1936, Sanger and her ministerial allies had succeeded in overturning the Comstock Law's prohibition on contraceptive literature. But the growing support for birth control depended on a careful framing of the issue. According to the Federal Council of Churches, which issued a statement supporting birth control, birth control was legitimate to promote family happiness and stability, not as a means for women's sexual freedom. The eugenic ideas that underwrote some support for contraception underlined the belief of most Christians that sex needed to be controlled. So in order to understand the various forces at work in this conversation about contraception, I want to suggest that today we, we come to terms with not just the cultural power of Christianity in United States history, but the legal power. Christians in the largest and most powerful Protestant denominations had until relatively recently legal power to impose morality on the nation's inhabitants, and maybe they still do. While the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution forbids a religious establishment, I can't give tax money directly to churches, we have long had what historian David Sehat calls a moral establishment. And this brings me to the argument I want to kind of pursue for the rest of the lecture. The moral establishment, these religious power brokers in our society, has long authorized a limited range of acceptable sexualities as the most visible way of regulating morality. Christians have done this because of two fundamental beliefs. Christianity maintain social order in the United States, and a belief that people's sexual choices have public consequences. So that's the argument. Now I'm going to continue to try to illustrate it with a few more stories. And this next episode also involves Anthony Comstock. He's just a lovely figure in our history. <laughs> In 1871, so we're going a little further back in history, women's rights advocate Victoria Woodhull gave an address laying out her support for free love. Marriages, she declared, have endeavored to hold the people in subjection to what has been considered a standard of moral purity. The courts hold if the law solemnly pronounces two married, they are married, whether love is present or not. It's a stupid law, 
which can find no analogies in nature. This speech, as you might imagine, was hugely controversial as she denounced marriage as a patriarchal sham designed to keep women in loveless unions where they lost their rights and their individuality. Some of this was based on her own experience. Woodhull had followed her first husband from Ohio to California, where his alcoholism drove the family to the brink of financial ruin. Woodhull turned to acting and occasionally prostitution in order to help the family stay afloat. By 1866, she had had enough. She left her husband, moved back east, and eventually landed in Manhattan with her sister, Tennessee Claflin, and Colonel James Blood, a noted advocate of free love. This is a fascinating story. The trio, they, they ended up at the house of railroad tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt, who took Claflin, Woodhull's sister, as a mistress, and then asked Woodhull to serve as his spirit medium, in which capacity she offered financial advice to the renowned industrialist. This was apparently good financial advice, so he, he began to reward the sisters with parts of the profits, and they were, uh, Woodhull and her sister were actually the two first, first two female stockbrokers on Wall Street. This was a woman who was breaking all the rules. She had worked as a prostitute to support her first husband, and then left him when she realized how ridiculous that was. She had ta taken up residence with a number of free love advocates and admitted to taking multiple sexual partners. She embraced spiritualism as a way of communing with the dead and leveraged her connections with her sister's wealthy lover to establish herself in one of the most masculine industries in the country, finance. By 1872, she actually launched uh, a campaign for the presidency, the first woman in American history to do so, and was joined by famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass. One of Woodhull's critics was the man that she is glaring at here on my slide, Henry Ward Beecher, <laughs> who was, according to a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning biography of him, the most famous man in America. Um, it's a 2007 biography by uh, historian Debbie Applegate. He was the pastor of Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, and on Sunday mornings, the ferries from Manhattan to Brooklyn were known as Beecher Boats because so many people would come to see his sermons. He won fame as an abolitionist, um, sent uh, support to anti-slavery forces in Kansas, and their rifles and bullets were actually referred to as Beecher's Bibles. Um, so he kind of inserted himself into all sorts of major social issues in the 19th century, including women's rights. In 1866, he endorsed female suffrage. But he did so, again, in a kind of careful way, um, much like the support of contraception had been framed, uh, or would be framed uh, 50 years later. Um, Beecher said women should have the right to vote because of their innate morality and piety. There was a belief in women's natural religiosity that had grown over the course of the 19th century. Women like Woodhull threatened the stereotype with her multiple lovers and unorthodox theology. Woodhull, for her part, thought Beecher was a hypocrite. Shortly after her 1871 speech announcing support for free love, Woodhull learned from various sources that Beecher had had an affair with one of his parishioners, a woman whose marriage ceremony he had performed. During her 1872 presidential campaign, she published news of the affair in her weekly newspaper. And she said, while she was honest about her support and practice of free love, Beecher was practicing it in secret while denouncing it from the pulpit. If she was aiming for publicity, she got it. The newspaper sold out, multiple print runs. Um, this is where Anthony Comstock shows up in the story. He uh, had a copy sent through the mail so he could arrest her on uh, charges of trading and obscenity and shut down the printing presses that were running the paper. But the story didn't die. Uh, Woodhull was determined to expose the hypocrisy of the moral establishment. And in 1874, Beecher's lover, Elizabeth Tilton, sued him for adultery. 
Beecher fought back. As it turned out, the story gets deeper. Elizabeth Tilton, this is uh, uh, the woman he had an affair with, her husband Theodore had developed an intimate relationship with Woodhull. <laughs> <laughs> And I know I should have a chart. OK. Um, a domestic uh, servant placed women's rights leaders, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in the same house, although he didn't allege that they were also um, having sex. Um, Elizabeth Tilton uh, changed her story about the affair three different times. Beecher steadfastly denied the whole thing. His adultery trial ended in a hung jury, and Beecher returned to the pulpit. The lesson of the story, I think, is that Woodhull's convictions couldn't be allowed to stand. Beecher's supporters circled the wagons and protected the most famous man in America from suffering for the affair. Theodore Tilton, who was a journalist, couldn't find work, uh, after the trial ended, Elizabeth, Beecher's former lover, was excommunicated from the church. And two years after the trial, in part because um, the heirs of Cornelius Vanderbilt were worried that Woodhull would expose uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt's um, interesting ideas, um, they essentially uh, paid her off and she left and went to England where she would trouble the American moral establishment no more. Now, um, Woodhull was close with one of the founding mothers of the 19th century women's rights movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and she was furious about the outcome of the trial. She called the outcome of the trial a holocaust of womanhood. And determined to show how establishment ministers like Henry Ward Beecher were the main obstacles standing in the way of women's rights. Given Beecher's professed support for women's rights and the fame of his sisters, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Catherine Beecher, a leading advocate for female education, this was a difficult case to make. And Stanton made it harder still to make in 19th century America by waging, in the last two decades of her life, a frontal assault on Christian ministers, who of course controlled the power. Against the advice of her colleague Susan B. Anthony, Stanton published the Woman's Bible in 1895. And I've got here, I'm, I'm sure you can't read it, that this is the manuscript copy in the Library of Congress of her commentary on the second chapter of Genesis, which is of course the second creation story recorded in Genesis in which Eve is created out of the rib of Adam. Stanton did not like that story very much. And she found it ridiculous that there should be two creation stories in the book of Genesis. So I'll read to you some of her commentary. Why should there be two contradictory accounts in the same book of the same event? Is it fair to infer that the second version, which is found in some form in the different religions of all nations, is a mere allegory symbolizing some mysterious conception of a highly imaginative editor? The first account dignifies woman as an important factor in the creation, equal in power and glory with man. The second makes her a mere afterthought, the world in good running order without her, the only reason for her advent being the solitude of man. It is evident that some wily writer, seeing the perfect equality of man and woman in the first chapter, felt it necessary for the dignity and dominion of man to affect women's subordination in some way. To do this, a spirit of evil must be introduced, which at once proved itself stronger than the spirit of good, and man's supremacy was based on the downfall of all that had just been pronounced very good. Stanton's argument about the second chapter of Genesis was based not on careful textual criticism, uh, historical critics of the Bible, suggests that the second chapter was probably written earlier than the first. 
It was believed, based on her belief that misogynistic Christians misused the Bible to justify patriarchal structure, even changed the Bible. Like Woodhull, Stanton believed that individual rights should reign supreme. Stanton's biographer, Kathy Kern, argues that her driving concern in the last two decades of her life was religious freedom, for she believed the church was the biggest obstacle standing in the way of women's rights. She denounced the greatest enemies of women as men who, quote, skulk behind the altar. <laughs> this head-on attack on Christian ministry was not enough to drive Stanton from fame. She, after all, had um, led the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, but many of her more radical followers were pushed aside in some of the mainstream women's rights association. Um, and historians have suggested in part that, that in, Stanton was making arguments that were maybe a little ahead of their time because this call for individual rights was what animated many of the protest movements of the 1960s. Movements like the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, the gay rights movement, and the anti-war movement. All of which suggested that individuals had a fundamental right. And those rights must be respected regardless of the way we'd always done it or old modes of thinking about gender, sexuality, and family. Many Conservative Americans experienced the 1960s as a time of profound dislocation. They described the world shifting beneath their feet, the foundations of society coming undone. And once again, as there was with Sanger, as there was with Woodhull, there was pushback from the moral establishment. And I want to talk about an episode from my own research in which we see conservative Christians arguing strenuously against what they saw as the dangers of the gay rights movement. Some of the most virulent arguments against individual freedoms in the 1970s and the 1980s came from critics of gay rights. The moral establishment put homosexuality under the spotlight. For them, the only family sanctioned by God the church and scripture involved heterosexual parents and children. Gays and lesbians in this reading flouted God-given sexuality in order, in pursuit of a hedonistic alternative lifestyle. Worse yet, evangelicals believed gays preyed on children. Throughout the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, Christian right periodicals repeatedly spotlighted an alleged link between homosexual behavior and pedophilia. Conservative Christians accused gay and gay men of trying to recruit children to the homosexual lifestyle. Most of us, said one Christian right leader, while feeling sorry for the homos, believe they should not be given in posts of importance lest our children come to regard the gay life as normal. In this climate of fear and persecution, singer Anita Bryant mounted one of the most important religious political campaigns of the 1970s. A popular gospel singer and former Miss Oklahoma, Bryant had traded on her wholesome appeal to market Florida orange juice around the country and settle into a comfortable life in South Florida. But she felt called into political action in January 1977 when her preacher at Northwest Baptist Church in Miami told the congregation about a proposed county ordinance that would eliminate restrictions preventing gays and lesbians from teaching in public schools. Like other evangelicals, Bryant believed that homosexuals intended to recruit children to their lifestyle. The thought of gay teachers was beyond the pale. Bryant stoked fears by focusing on the ability of a gay teacher to influence impressionable young minds that um, stood in stark contrast to their parents' values. When Dade County commissioners passed the ordinance allowing gays and lesbians to teach in public schools, Bryant went to battle. 
She described the county ordinance as an attempt to legitimize homosexuals and the recruitment plan to ch for children. Bryant distributed leaflets that tied gay men to several recent child abuse cases. The media aided Bryant's campaign by disseminating statistics that wildly exaggerated gays' propensity for pedophilia. One of her organization's flyers declared, there is no human right to corrupt our children. Both the flyer and the group's name, Save Our Children, suggested the fear that animated the Christian rights opposition to gay rights. Evangelicals thought gays and lesbians intended to pervert innocent children. Voters agreed. During the spring, local volunteers collected over 60,000 signatures, six times the number required by law, for a petition to hold a popular referendum on the ordinance. Two weeks before the Dade County, Dade County residents voted on the measure, 10,000 anti-gay rights activists gathered in Miami for a God and decency rally led by the Reverend Jerry Falwell. These high-profile events demonstrated the growing power of the opposition to gay rights among evangelical Christians, and by a two-to-one margin, Dade County residents voted in June 1977 to overturn the ordinance Bryant had succeeded in keeping gays and lesbians out of the county schools. Now, prior to the 1970s, the moral establishment hadn't said all that much about gays and lesbians for the obvious reason that the vast majority were in the closet. But the protests of the 1960s and the proliferation of new gay rights organizations suggested that the moral foundations on which society had built were crumbling. Gay rights organizations had success in the 1970s. In 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. And 16 states repealed sodomy statutes between 1971 and 1976. A 1975 Time magazine cover featured an Air Force officer declaring, I am a homosexual. These de developments frightened many conservative Christians who by the late 1970s talked about gays and lesbians as a sort of fifth column that had infiltrated the highest reaches of American government. This development echoed the lavender scare of the 1950s in which conservative politicians painted gays and lesbians as threats to national security. A congressional investigation of, quote, sex perverts in the federal government coincided with and reinforced Senator Joseph McCarthy's hunt for communists in the State Department. Three dec decades later, evangelicals were still sounding the alarm about gays in government. In 1980, Jerry Falwell recounted a conversation with President Jimmy Carter. I asked the president, Falwell said, why do you have known practicing homosexuals on your staff in the White House? Carter replied, well, I'm president of all the American people. I believe I should represent everyone. To that, Falwell answered, why don't you have some murderers and bank robbers and so forth? The Carter campaign subsequently released tapes proving this exchange never occurred. But evangelicals were convinced that something was going wrong, that gay people intended to recruit their children, and they made gay rights this key plank of what they called the family values agenda. Many of them cited increasing prevalence of homosexuality as a sign of America's downfall. Falwell again, history proves that homosexuality reaches a pandemic level in societies in crisis or in a state of collapse. Another um, leader of the Christian right, there are absolutes in the world. Just as jumping off a building will kill a person, so will the spread of homosexuality bring about a demise of American culture as we know it. Here was another example of Christian leaders arguing that people's sexual choices had dramatic public consequences. Christian right leaders portrayed the struggle against gay rights as a contest of authority. In his 1978 book, The Unhappy Gays, Minister Tim LaHaye contended that the erosion of parental authority had contributed to countless children's, quote, conversion to homosexuality. He counseled parents whose son came out of the closet not to kick him out of the house because doing so would, quote, throw him to the homosexual wolves who are anxious to prey upon his young body. 
LaHaye's characterization reflected two key beliefs about homosexuality common to conservative Christians in the late 1970s. First, evangelicals insisted that gays and lesbians were not born that way. Rather, people, quote, became homosexuals as they indulged sinful thoughts. The book, and I'm not making this up, even includes a mathematical formula. <laughs> a predisposition toward homosexuality plus the first homosexual experience times pleasurable and positive homosexual thoughts plus more homosexual experiences times more pleasurable thoughts equals a homosexual. LaHaye assumed, <laughs> there, there is some thought, yes. LaHaye assumed that everyone had what he called heterosexual potential and that homosexuality, like other sins, could be overcome. Okay, I promised two beliefs. Second, conservative evangelicals thought of gays and lesbians as particularly immoral. In a 1979 newsletter, conservative political operative H. Edward Rowe declared, there is no way that one can begin to describe in decent company the depth of depravity exhibited by homosexuals. Rowe forged ahead anyway, outlining for his decent readers the preponderance of sadism, masochism, pederasty, pedophilia, venereal disease, and suicide among gays and lesbians. Now Rowe went further than most of his compatriots. But conservative evangelical accounts of homosexuality emphasized the salacious. Most insisted that promiscuity was the norm and that lifelong monogamy was virtually non-existent among gays and lesbians. Tracts against gay rights never failed to describe the frequency of casual and even anonymous sex among homosexuals, often portraying gay bathhouses in New York and San Francisco as the modern equivalents of Sodom. Of course, these caricatures were gross exaggerations and only depicted a tiny fraction of people engaging in same-sex behavior. I want to point to a central irony here. I began the lecture talking about the attempts to censor. And now we have these very graphic displays of sexuality in evangelical writing. Now these were meant to condemn certain types of sexuality, but there's an even more interesting development that's happened over the last 50 years. Namely, the tendency of evangelical periodicals and magazines and um, purity associations to talk very frankly about positive sexuality, which is, as Joanna reminded us in the uh, romance novels, uh, always taking place within the bounds of a heterosexual marriage. This picture is from, um, this is Pastor Ed Young and his wife Lisa, who, um, in order to promote his book, The Sex Experiment, promised to spend 24 hours in bed atop the church and live stream it for the internet in 2012. The Sex Experiment was a challenge to Young's parishioners and readers, those who were married, to engage in sexual intercourse uh, every day for a week as a way of reinvigorating their marriage. This tradition of evangelical ministers speaking frankly and positively about sexual pleasure goes back at least to 1973 when Maribel Morgan published The Total Woman. The Total Woman encouraged women to embrace their sexuality for the benefit of their husband and their marriage. You can be, quote, a smoldering sex pot or an all-American fresh beauty, a pixie or a pirate, a cowgirl or a showgirl, all within the boundaries of a heterosexual marriage. This is a long way from Anthony Comstock. <laughs> Evangelicals over the last 50 years have come to a belief that the pursuit of purity can be conducted right alongside the pursuit of pleasure. As long as Christians contain sexuality within one particular form. I want to suggest, as I kind of wrap up here, that this is in part a response 
to the weakening of Christian moral control. Those social protest movements of the 1960s and 1970s had real consequences in our laws. The Supreme Court issued several decisions, beginning with the 1947 decision, Everson versus uh, Connecticut. I uh, don't have it in front of me. Um, Everson decision uh, quoted Thomas Jefferson's phrase, the wall of separation between church and state. And Supreme Court decisions repeatedly in the 1950s and 1960s upheld a stronger separation of church and state. The demographic majority of white Christians has declined. Um, and uh, just in the last 10 years, uh, white non-Hispanic Christians are, are now no longer uh, a majority of the American population. And these changes have led to new expressions of sexuality, new uh, um, legal ways of doing sex in our culture. And that has meant that in order for conservative Christians to maintain their views on acceptable sexualities, they've had to shift the battleground somewhat and become more explicit and more frank about sexuality, even to indulge the thought that sex is and can be for pleasure, not just procreation. But they have retained, I think, a strong sense that Sexual decisions are public in nature. They have public consequences. They are not just matters between you and God, but rather um, the decisions that people make about their sexual lives will affect the state of our society. And that, I think, explains at least partly why there has been so much pushback on the liberalizing of our sexual laws. We live in a culture that is deeply divided about sex, and it's deeply divided in part because there are a large number of Christians who feel something very fundamental to our success as a society is being lost with the liberalizing trends in our sexual laws and cultural norms. Thank you. So, I believe the schedule says we are here, uh, we have till five. That's a lot of time for q and I wish I could call the panel back up and have some more questions for them. But I am happy uh, to, to answer questions and we'll stay as long as people have questions and then break for dinner, so. Hi. Um, I know the rise of the religious right as a political force also had a lot to do with racism. Yes. Um, so can you say a little bit about the connections between, and, you know, whites being racist, often they talk about morals and sex a lot. Can you sp speak to the yes, sure. connection there? Um, I have lots to say. Um, <laughs> so uh, historians have this longstanding argument about causes of the religious right. And my view is it's multi-causal. Um, it's at least in part a response to the advances of the civil rights movement in the sense that many white Christians had that racial segregation was, um, if not ordained by God, it was the natural way of living. And so the civil rights movement challenged to racial segregation conducted uh, through uh, biblical interpretation and through Christian ministers leading nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, was deeply threatening to a lot of uh, white Christians uh, in this country. And uh, the Christian right uh, did a number of things to push back against racial integration, notably um, founding many uh, private Christian schools in the 1960s and 70s as bastions of racial segregation. Um, I've researched those schools, um, and what's interesting about them is the ways in which uh, they're at pains to suggest they're not primarily intended to preserve racial segregation. And I think it's impossible to make a kind of blanket judgment of all private Christian schools. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, certainly some were just there to preserve segregation. Um, but the more interesting cases uh, are the ones in which um, we do get uh, very strong uh, indications through um, 
dress codes, conduct codes, through marketing materials um, that um, men and women uh, observing both proper gender roles, that is um, not uh, kind of crossing over uh, norms about how they should act and behave uh, was really crucial and also not uh, engaging in premarital relationships. Um, and there is, I think, often a subtle but unmistakable racism in some of the comparisons that you can see in these um, materials, um, but it, it's under the surface, right? You have to read between the lines to get it in most cases, particularly after the 1960s. Um, and so, is race part of the story of the Christian right? Absolutely. Is it bound up with these thoughts about gender and sexuality? Absolutely. Um, and I appreciate the question to give me the chance to elaborate on it, because it obviously wasn't a big part of the formal presentation. So thanks. OK, so I know a lot of Christians, when they're confronted with issues of homosexuality, and they're like, going against it and trying to say why they think it's wrong, they turn to the Bible mm -hmm. and like try to quote certain pa passages, but it always seems like they're like stretching truths or like trying to pick and choose what to listen to. What have you found in your studies and like what can you say to that? Yeah. Uh, these passages, I think there are about seven of them, are, are sometimes referred to as the clobber passages because you get clobbered over the head with them. Um, the, I'm not a, a biblical scholar. I've learned much from my colleagues who are uh, about historical and contextual readings of these passages that suggest that whatever activity they are condemning bears little or no resemblance to um, modern day relationships between consenting adults of the same sex. Um, that. Um, and I, I don't want to speak too much further on that because there's probably a lot of people in the room who know more than I do about them. Um, but when I have, um, let me take this two ways. One, as a historian, um, you know, one of the things that I can call attention to in my writing is the ways in which um, readings that are presented as straightforwardly biblical are actually quite contested readings of the Bible. And I think as a historian, it's, it's my job to always kind of call attention to the, to the ways in which, well, that's actually not at all how families were constructed in the ancient Mediterranean. It's very much how families were constructed in 19th century Victorian America, right? What you're calling biblical is actually Victorian. So I try to do that work in my historical work. Uh, when I get into you know personal conversations, um, uh, I, I you know I attempt to suggest, like it sounds like you do, is this kind of we're picking and choosing a certain number of passages from a very big book that contains uh, lots of material, and you know maybe let's explore both contextualized readings of these passages and maybe some other passages uh, and themes that get emphasized more uh, in scripture. So. Two uh, recent historical events uh, that I'm wondering about how they reflect on your deeper historical plunge. Um, the, the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and the outing of uh, male ministers mm -hmm. who have uh, crossed all kinds of boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is the I Kiss Dating Goodbye and the retraction yeah. of that particular uh, book by the author now who has become a, a TED... Um, stage, you know, uh, phenom, so. Okay. So, um, for the Me Too movement and, uh, and then these various um, just horrible exposés of sexual abuse, um, not just in Catholic churches, but also there's been lots of publications recently about Southern Baptist uh, congregations where this has gone on. And the... The research uh, that I know of uh, about um, the connection between uh, more conservative theologies of gender and sexuality and um, 
the issue of um, sexual abuse uh, suggests that the we don't have any strong linkages between the theology and increased incidence of abuse. What we do have good evidence is that theologies um, that really emphasize kind of the family, preservation of the family at all costs, um, can really hinder um, healing and recovery for victims of abuse in congregations. Um, and it's not just research. We have you know, so many heartbreaking personal testimony of victims who have, have talked about how they just couldn't come forward in their congregation because they knew what the answer would be or they did come forward and uh, they got advice that, that was um, uh, profoundly unhelpful and maybe even damaging. Um, the, the purity culture question about uh, Josh Harris, um, many of you I'm sure are familiar with his uh, book from the late 90s, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Um, if you're not, it was a sensation when I was in college um, and it essentially, uh, well, it, it didn't essentially, it suggested that um, Christians should forego dating um, and, and kind of called to an older model of courtship um, and that um, you should refrain even from kissing uh, your partner until your wedding night. So um, uh, the author, Josh Harris, um, recently recanted uh, this book and then actually um, said, by the way I understand Christianity, I'm not even a Christian anymore. Um, and I think his story underlines the ways in which um, purity culture and teachings about appropriate sex have become so foundational for certain segments of Christianity that people can't even hold on to their faith once they renounce that aspect of its moral teaching. Uh, which I find profoundly sad because we've heard today all these really constructive resources in the Christian tradition for thinking about sexuality and a broader range of appropriate sexualities. Um, but Harris, who, who you know, had this publishing sensation in his 20s and then became a, a famous minister and a big speaker, um, at least as far as I know, this came out a few months ago, said, I, I just, you know, I can't consider myself a Christian anymore. Um, and I think that's bound up with the centrality of purity culture in a particular slice of American Christianity. So you talked about um, Margaret Sanger and uh, Victoria Woodhall and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but, um, and each of them and the ways in which they moved the needle forward mm -hmm. um, for more progressive understandings. Mm -hmm. Um, but none of them am I hearing, or do I even recall in my own knowledge, did that from a faith perspective? Or did they, and are there examples where the needle is pushed forward from a faith perspective? Yes, yes. So there are, um, happily, uh, some uh, examples of people who push forward. I mean, Woodhull was herself a spiritualist, which was this kind of vast religious movement in the 19th century, um, uh, obviously not um, kind of in line with the majority Protestant views of the day, uh, then or now. Um, but she clearly understood uh, her activity as having a religious component. Um, it was not aligned with dominant Christian theology uh, at the time. Stanton uh, found herself uh, increasingly alienated from the church and, and really felt like the church was an obstacle. Um, I think her, her views echo um, uh, the words of uh, Frederick Douglass, who I mentioned briefly, who in his autobiography in 1845 said, the Christianity of this land, I, I find just the widest possible gulf between American Christianity and the, the religion of Jesus. Um, um, but Marie Griffith's book, uh, which I mentioned, uh, and, and Griffith was, is a wonderful historian who, who, who I, I cribbed the, the Sanger story from her book. Um, she spends a lot of time on 
the liberal Christians who did kind of push the, the so I will defer to her and, and encourage you to go read her book because it's really good. Um, um, but she writes about uh, various ministers who came out in support of abortion rights before Roe versus Wade was even decided. She writes about um, ministers uh, who were kind of embracing uh, some of the teacher teachings of cultural anthropology in the 1930s and 40s that suggested uh, racial differences were not fundamental, but rather we were kind of all uh, mostly the same and that we shouldn't be scared of interracial dating and sex. And so um, we do have plenty of, of examples, um, um, including our first two speakers today, of Christians who are uh, embracing um, more liberal positions on sexuality and, uh, as you put it, kind of advancing the cause. So. I'm old enough to remember when uh, President Jimmy Carter was interviewed by Playboy magazine. Yeah. And in that interview, uh, he admitted he confessed that he had committed adultery in his heart. Mm -hmm. And I've read where that had a great deal to do with uh, a subsequent uh, campaign where he was seeking a, a second term and was defeated, I believe, by uh, President Reagan, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. My, uh, what I've been wondering about is the, uh, the weaponizing of sexuality in American political life. And I'm, 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 I'd, like to, I'd like to ask you to share your thoughts on that subject, uh, given the uh, contemporary scene in America today. Yeah. That episode in particular is interesting because the research that I did on Christian right responses, I mean, the comment I, I committed adultery in, a, in, in my heart flabbergasted a lot of secular Americans, but for a lot of Christians who knew exactly which passage of the Gospels Carter was referring to, it was like, I understand what he means. The bigger issue, I think, for a lot of conservatives was that he gave an interview to Playboy. Um, and um, I mean, uh, Anita Bryant uh, also gave an interview to Playboy that is surreal, um, and <laughs> in which she claims all sorts of ignorance about homosexuality that just boggles the mind. Um, but that in itself, suggested that Carter was not defending Christian values to a lot of conservative Christians. And, you know, what I see as um, maybe a clumsy attempt at, but at kind of frankly dealing with these strenuous con commands that Jesus lays out that, you know, you know, I, you know, I tell you, don't, you know, the Ten Commandments say don't commit adultery, but even if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've done so. Um, you know, I think that word you use, weaponizing, accurately describes the ways in which um, kind of any sense of, of subtlety or nuance gets lost in some of these battles. Um, uh, there was no attempt to grapple with the substance of what Carter was saying. There was just a kind of condemnation. He's not a true Christian because he's speaking to Playboy magazine. Um, and what I sense today, the battle lines are different, um, and I think the evangelical Christians have grown more comfortable with explicit discussions of sex, um, but there is still a widespread condemnation of homosexuality, but even more so transgender rights, non-binary understandings of gender, um, strike uh, a significant segment of the American population as, you know, fundamentally wrong. And, and there's just, you know, ridicule kind of of people who would, for instance, um, uh, give their pronouns or um, institutions that would uh, have gender neutral bathrooms, right? This is seen as this kind of uh, you know, both ridiculous and also uh, dangerous assertion of chaos 
Um, and, and we struggle to kind of live in the in-between, uh, at least in the political sphere. I don't find this to be as true when you sit down and talk to people. Um, but our political life, which is now conducted uh, in really harmful ways on social media, all kind of nuance is lost and, and weaponizing is the order of the day. Um, so I, I guess I agree with you. I don't know much more to say. So I know you've done some research and work on masculinity, yeah. and I, I'm curious about how concepts of masculinity and male leadership played into um, up, upholding oppression and mm -hmm. causing a course for how they would determine the conversation around sexuality. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I'm currently working a lot and thinking a lot about masculinity. Um, and there's this, you know, rich literature about the rise of a movement called muscular Christianity in the progressive era. So around the turn of the 20th century, um, there were all sorts of Christian leaders uh, really across the theological spectrum calling for this sort of manly Christianity. And we need a manly Christianity in order to change the world. Um, and what's unspoken in a lot of that is the ways in which muscular Christianity was um, a movement that took place among elites that was pitched at uh, white men. Um, it, it took shape in colleges and universities where only about 2% of the population attended colleges and universities around the turn of the 20th century. And it always carried the presumption that, I mean, this was the era of, if you know, Rudyard Kipling's famous poem, 1899, The White Man's Burden. Right? It's the white man's burden to civilize the world. And those ideas of white Christian men's responsibility get baked into this idea of what proper Christian masculinity should be. Right? And that's, that implied, or maybe not implied, but it, it's become even more explicit, I think, in recent years, uh, notion that white Christian men um, have been placed by God in positions of authority ends up undermining uh, attempts at egalitarianism, but also in situations of abuse, it undermines the ability to address that because he's been given authority. And, um, and so when I was speaking about abuse earlier, I think ideas of masculinity play into the difficulty in healing and recovery in those situations. Yeah. In the same vein, um, how did white Christian masculinity react to the rights movements of the 60s and 70s? Oh, not well. Um, <laughs> um, What's kind of fascinating, I'll back up a little and say, is that the opposition to second wave feminism, um, there, there were prominent male ministers who led the charge against feminism, conservative politicians, um, but it was also driven in part by anti-feminist women and the ways in which Patriarchal views operate among women, I think, uh, deserve uh, attention in this story. Um, there's this whole movement um, in the 1970s called Stop ERA, Stop the Equal Rights Amendment, um, that was led by a Catholic woman, Phyllis Schlafly, who argued um, what feminists want is not what most women want. Um, most women desire to be wives and mothers first. And, um, and so there is, I think, um, uh, patriarchal norms about the family kind of embedded in the, the work of anti-feminist women. But um, to answer your question um, more directly, what we see in men's movements of the last 30 or 40 years um, are, I think, kind of interesting if, I think, incomplete responses to the 1960s. So many of you probably remember this uh, the Promise Keepers, this kind of meteor, meteoric men's movement in the 1990s. 
The Promise Keepers was founded by a football coach who, in part because he had been a football coach at a major Division I university, understood structural racism better than the vast majority of white evangelicals. Um, he was talking about structural racism. He didn't use that exact term, but that's what he was talking about in the 1990s, which was way before most white evangelicals even kind of approached that subject. Some still haven't gotten there. But he did so in the context of a thoroughly conservative gender ideology, right? And so there's a, an attempt to make peace or to come to grips with the, the claims of the civil rights movement, right? Black people have been oppressed since this country's beginning and we need redress. Um, and Bill McCartney, the founder of Promise Keepers, agreed with that. Um, he didn't necessarily get full-throated support from all his members, um, but he was at least kind of trying to grapple with the civil rights movement. Um, on the other hand, feminism to him seemed like a perversion of God's good intention for the family in which men would lead. Um, and so uh, I think it's a mixed bag. Okay, this you may not be able to answer, but how would this conversation be framed differently if we included anthropologists in it? I'm trying to think about your question. Can, 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 I, can you say more about what anthropologists might provide? Uh, we're talking primarily about Western civilization. Okay, all right. Not just Western, but North American, not just North American, but US. Right. Yeah. How would an anthropologist contribute to a conversation on human sexuality, and in what ways would their contributions be different from what we've talked about? <laughs> I think your first inclination is, is, is right. I, I, I probably can't speak uh, <laughs> too intelligently uh, since my expertise is largely about religious history in the United States. Um, you know, what I have learned from uh, some of my colleagues around the room are uh, there are, you know, a variety of ways in which cultures have configured gender and sexuality. And um, and that makes me hesitant to proclaim any sort of universal human inclination towards. Um, I'm a historian who thinks the particular contexts uh, in which we live um, are really crucial for understanding the trajectory we're on, how we got here and, and where we're going. And so I would hesitate to make any blanket pronouncements about, you know, this is kind of a, the typical way human sexuality gets configured in all societies, because I just don't, I don't think you can. Um, and I think I'm gonna stop talking before I get in any more uh, <laughs> trouble. Please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Dollin. Perhaps. <laughs>